Okay, so what I want to focus on now um, is the genes and transcripts. So we've actually already been exploring the genes and transcripts in the location tab, just very briefly. Um, so what I want to do now um, is spend a bit more time um, thinking about how the genes and transcripts are annotated uh, in Ensemble and how we can get more information about them in the browser. So when you're looking at genes um, and transcripts in Ensemble, um, what you're actually looking at is the product um, of two uh, independent gene annotation methodologies. So um, firstly, we have what we call an automated or automatic gene annotation, um, which is uh, uh, an automated process of gene annotation um, that we use across all species that we have in Ensemble. So every species in Ensemble has genes that have been annotated by an automated pipeline. So we'll talk about how the pipeline works in a moment, um, but it essentially uses biological data, such as cDNA sequences, RNA-seq data, to map to the genome to predict where the genes and uh, the transcripts, obviously, that make up those genes exist. For a small number of other species, we also have manual gene annotation. So for human, mouse, rat, and zebrafish, we have manual gene annotation from the Havana group. So you can see this is their logo. They're actually part of the ensemble team, but they're a group of maybe a dozen curators um, that are responsible for moving painstakingly along the genome of these different species, uh, annotating the transcripts based on, again, database data. So published um, literature, for example, as well, uh, and lots of other different types of biological data. So. For most species, the genes you're actually going to see are just the product of the automated gene annotation pipeline. But for these four species, what you're actually going to see uh, is the merged set of genes that are the product of these two methods. So for human, for example, we would have the automated pipeline um, annotating a set of genes uh, and then the manual annotation by the Havana team creating their own independent list of genes. Uh, and then the gene build process is to then integrate the, the annotation from these two methodologies uh, to produce one final gene set um, that have been annotated by these two separate methods, independent methods. So to quickly summarize the, the two methodologies in a bit more detail, the automated pipeline uh, is used on all the species in Ensemble uh, and it makes predictions of the genes and their transcripts based on experimental data. So the types of data that the pipeline uses, uh, firstly is nucleotide sequences, so it takes um, nucleotide sequences such as cDNA sequences, ESTs, express sequence tags, uh, and RNA-seq data from the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Consortium. So the INSDC consortium that is formed of ENA, GenBank, and DDBJ. So we take nucleotide sequences from these repositories, feed them into the pipeline, and then those sequences are aligned to the genome and used as evidence um, to annotate the genes. Then we also take protein sequences. So we look to the UniProt databases that are um, named SwissProt and Tremble. So we take protein sequences from UniProt, uh, align those to the genome as well. Uh, That's just what the pipeline does, aligns them to the genome and also uses those as evidence uh, in the gene annotation as well. Oh. Uh, what we can also do um, is use um, homologous sequences. So we can infer genes um, based on homology from closely related species as well. So as an example, we could predict genes in the chimpanzee by mapping human cDNA and protein sequences to the chimp genome. Now, obviously, there's going to be perhaps some mismatches, uh, but generally because of the close evolutionary relationship between human and chimpanzee, um, the sequences will very um, closely align uh, to the genome. Uh, and they can be used as evidence in annotating the chimp genes. For the manual gene annotation, uh, as I said, it's a case by case determination uh, of the gene models uh, based on the curator's uh, investigations. So they'll look um, at a number of different sources for data. So they'll look at different nucleotide sequence databases, RNA-seq data, long read transcriptome data, uh, mass spec data, um, literature and publications, citations and things. So they'll investigate all of these different main data types to also um, annotate the genes and their transcript models as well. So I'm guessing you've already um, worked out some of the advantages and disadvantages of the manual gene annotation. So 
The disadvantage is that it's slower and that it's a much smaller scale. So that's why we have uh, only the manual gene annotation for a small number of species. Um, but the benefits that it's, that it's much more comprehensive um, and that we actually require less evidence um, compared to the pipeline. So obviously the, the automated pipeline requires a threshold of evidence to, um, to annotate a transcript or a feature in, in that region. Whereas a manual curator can go through judge the quality of the underlying supporting evidence uh, and use that as, uh, as a reason for annotating the gene or and its transcripts. And the, the manual annotation is really good at picking up things like different UTR lengths, splicing patterns, single exon transcripts, and, and things like the IG genes as well. So um, what we really think is that it's the combination of these automated and manual methods that really produces uh, a very complete uh, and well annotated gene set. So when you're looking in ensemble, um, what you might find uh, are what we call golden transcripts. So a golden transcript um, will be annotated for only those species with manual annotation, human, mouse, rat, and zebrafish. Uh, and the golden transcripts are where there has been identical annotation between the automated and the manual methods. So where both of these methods have, I, have come up independently with the same transcript model, we would label that as golden. This is just to give you some indication that um, uh, some indication that it's perhaps higher quality, uh, and to give you some confidence in the annotation that two different methods have come up with the same transcript model. Um, and then the the other thing to to point out that I think is very important is is the term gen code. So um, you might see or you might have read gen code um, in lots of different papers, the term gen code. Uh, you might see it in Ensemble and, and other databases as well. But basically the gen code gene set uh, is the Ensemble gene set. So it's the merged set of Ensemble automatically annotated genes and Havana manually annotated genes. So obviously we only have human and mouse gen code gene sets because these are the only two species that have whole genome annotation, both automated and manual. Uh, and so the gen code gene set is what we present in Ensemble. So it's the Ensemble gene set. Uh, and it's actually the default gene set that's used by a number of different projects, such as Nomad, ENCODE, 1000 Genomes, and other major projects. So when you're reading a paper and it says, we exported the, the gen code gene set to be used as a reference in our annotation, for example, uh, if they're doing their own experiment with a reference um, gene set, and they've used the gen code, you know that they've come to Ensemble and they've downloaded the Ensemble gene set to be used in their, in their own data. So when you see the word gen code, um, that's what you um, can infer that it means. One of the other more um, important projects that's currently underway um, is the annotation of main transcripts. So one of the, one of the problems um, that many scientists, clinicians, bioinformaticians, scientists have um, is that there are actually more than one group, there's more than one group that is interested in performing gene annotation uh, for human. So obviously um, at the EBI in Ensemble, um, we have our Genco gene set and the uh, automated and the manual methods um, to produce the genes and the transcripts uh, annotation. Uh, but the NCBI have uh, an equal, uh, have, have, a, have a similar project um, where they also annotate genes and transcript sequences. Um, and people find this quite confusing because sometimes there are discrepancies between the two annotation sets. So what we're doing um, is working on a project with NCBI called MAIN, M-A-N-E, which stands for Matched Annotation from the NCBI and EBI projects. So what we're working on um, is annotating uh, a single transcript uh, for each human protein coding gene um, that is biologically relevant um, and has 100% identity between both Ensemble, EBI, um, and the NCBI resources. So at the moment, we have what we call the main select version 0.91, which is available in Ensemble 102, uh, which is around 90% of human protein coding transcripts with a main select transcript annotated. So you can choose that main select transcript as the agreed upon transcripts across NCBI and EBI that's biologically and clinically relevant and, and highly expressed. 
So this helps me to explain which transcript you should use. So we're going to see this in the browser in just a moment. Um, when you're looking through Ensemble, you'll find that for a gene, um, you might have many, many transcripts annotated. Um, and when I say transcripts, um, this is the term that we use in Ensemble. Um, some people in some groups use the term isoforms or splice variants. Um, we use the word transcript um, to refer to the different transcripts of the gene. So here we can see the ESRRA gene, uh, and it's made up of these eight different transcripts. Um, some of them are protein coding and some of them are not. We'll think about that in a moment. Um, but you can see over on the right hand side uh, in the table, we have these flags. Uh, and I'm going to show you this in the browser as well. But you can see, for example, um, this transcript at the top here uh, is the main select transcript. Uh, and it also has these other um, annotations with it as well. So when you're trying to pick which transcript might be the most highly expressed, most biologically relevant transcript. The first one that I would always look for is to see if there is a main select transcript. Uh, and that one is what you can look for here in this case. If there is no main select transcript, you can look at some of these other options. So the next thing would be the APRI annotation. So APRIS is a, a group um, based in Spain um, that are responsible for going through the human genes and annotating a principal isoform uh, based on protein structural information, functionally con conserved residues, cross species alignments, and those sorts of things. So you can see here, they have um, a different notation at pre P1, P2, P3, et cetera. And you can find out what that means by hovering. Gencode basic. So these are the complete transcripts that have a start and a stop code on. So you can see here, this Gencode basic transcripts are full length transcripts, whereas these are CDS five prime or three prime incomplete. Uh, and then finally, we have what we call the TSL, the transcript support level. So this is an arbitrary score of between one and five to indicate the quality of the underlying data. So um, TSL score of one indicates that there is some um, unambiguous um, data underlying that the annotation of that transcript, whereas a TSL score of two, three, four, or five indicates that there might be um, some, some issues that have been flagged with the underlying data. So what I've been explaining um, is the process of gene annotation for ensemble, so for the vertebrate species. Uh, but the process is actually a little bit different for ensemble genomes when we're looking at the non-vertebrates. So um, in, ensemble, in ensemble genomes, we don't do any of the gene annotation ourselves. Um, what we do is we rely on the communities, um, the research groups that are working with those species to perform the gene annotation themselves. Uh, and then to deposit that gene annotation also uh, into publicly available archives. So these different research groups might use very similar methods. So they might use automated annotation using cDNA protein sequences, just like the Ensemble Automated Pipeline does. They might do some homology annotation like the Ensemble Pipeline does. Some groups have some manual annotation as well. Uh, and some groups also use um, ab initio predictions as well. So this is just an example of some of the different species that we have in ensemble genomes uh, and who's produced the gene annotation and how they have. So you can see here that um, bread wheat, triticum ostivum, the gene annotation is produced by the Erlem Institute and they use a combination uh, of cDNA and protein sequence mapping uh, and homology sequence mapping as well. Um, you can see uh, as an example that Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a, a model organism for plants as well, this gene set is produced by the TEAR project, uh, which uses a combination of cDNA and protein mapping, homology mapping, and manual annotation as well. So this is just a snapshot of um, the, to, to try and demonstrate that um, the different species in ensemble genomes have annotation coming from the communities, uh, and that those communities use a combination of methods um, to annotate those genes. So how, um, just how Ensemble imports the genome assemblies from, uh, from ENA and the other INSDC databases, um, we would also import the, the genes, uh, the gene model. So you can see here, for example, this is uh, a genome sequence record in ENA for Staph aureus, a bacteria here we can see, uh, and we would import the genome assembly and the, the gene annotation directly from the ENA um, 
the ENA records. So when you're looking um, at a gene in Ensemble, um, this is what you might come across, something that looks similar to this. And this is what we saw in the genome browser already in the previous demo. So what you can see is that we have a number of different transcripts. And I can see there's a question that's just come in the, in the text box. Are the blocks exons? So I'm just going to explain this right now. So we can see that um, for a single gene like BRCA2 here, we have a number of transcripts and they're all colored in different colors. So firstly, we have the golden transcript, which is a merged transcript. So we know that these golden transcripts are the transcripts that have been uh, independently annotated by both the automated and the manual methods. The red transcripts are protein coding, and then the blue transcripts are non-coding transcripts. And you can see the description of the biotype here as well. So the gold and red are both protein coding. So if this if this transcript were not gold, it would be red, but the gold color supersedes the red color. Uh, and then the blue non-coding transcripts might be processed transcripts, retained uh, intron transcripts, nonsense mediated decay transcripts, for example. So then if we look at another trans, if we look at one of the transcripts in detail, we can see it's made up of these blocks and lines. So we can see here, um, the blocks are the exons and the lines that are connecting them are the introns. So here we have an exon uh, and then the lines are the introns. If you are keen eyed, you might see at the very end here, we have a block that is not colored in. So where we have an, uh, a, an, a non-colored block, this is a non-coding exon. So you can see here, for example, this is part of the coding sequence. These exons are all parts of the coding sequence, including this final one. So this is, the coding sequence will here will be the, th uh, the stop codon, and then this is the three prime UTR. So this is the non coding exon. This is the three prime UTR. The final thing to notice is the arrows, which indicate the direction of transcription. So this is showing me that this is the five prime end at the left hand side moving left to right because the arrow is pointing left to right on the screen. If the transcript was on the reverse strand, the arrow would be pointing in the opposite direction pointing right to left. So we have, so I have a, a direct question as well. So is the five prime UTR included in the transcript? So yes, the five prime UTR will be if, if it's annotated. So sometimes this, this view uh, becomes a bit difficult to, to actually view the UTRs because if the UTR is particularly small, uh, based on the, the, the length of the sequence and the resolution of the screen, it might just be that this block here actually is UTR, but it just sort of resolves to a single sort of colored line. So what I would do in this case is zoom in on the end here to see exactly where the UTR, but yes, the UTR will be part of the, the first, the five prime UTR will be part of the first uh, exon uh, generally, or perhaps part of the first few exons um, and will be here. So we have the coding exons, introns and non-coding exons you can see here for example and then the colors indicate the the biotype the next thing to point out is the stable ids so as well as um, when we're annotating the genes or when we import the genes uh, at that point they don't have names we just know that this is a gene and this is a gene and this is a gene uh, along the genome so at that point we give them stable ids so the stable IDs always start with ENS and then G for gene with an 11 digit number and then a version uh, with a point and then with a version number as well. Uh, and then the same for transcripts, ENST, peptides, ENSP, exons, ENSE and regulatory regions, ENSR. So each of these features has their own unique stable ID and these will remain the same across the ensemble releases. Um, for non-vertebrate species, um, we will use the IDs that come from the, the annotation source, so from the communities that have done the annotation themselves. Uh, and then for non-human species, we have, for example, mouse, we have uh, MUS for mus musculus as a, as a prefix that goes into the, the, uh, the stable ID. Uh, and that's for all non-human species. So the important thing to notice is that only after this process do we then import the gene names. Um, so um, what will happen is that there is a, a consortium that's responsible for 
annotating the gene names. So the, in this case, the HGNC, the Hugo Gene Nomenclature Committee, um, will say that this gene, ENSG 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, is the BRCA2 gene. So then the gene name will be assigned to a specific gene stable ID. Uh, and then that will be presented in ensemble. So, um, so the question from Liz is for BRCA2, there is no ENSG. So that's, uh, okay, so I just, hopefully I just answered your question. Um, we'll see this in a moment, um, how we can search for gene names and gene IDs in the browser uh, and, and get that that way. So um, the, the important thing to know is that obviously the gene names can change over time. Obviously, as, as scientific literature evolves, as publications are published, as databases are updated, the, the gene names are not necessarily stable and gene synonyms can be used in different communities, et cetera. So what we would always advise you to do is to make a note of the stable ID that's assigned to your gene of interest. And then you know that you're always looking at the same gene every time that you come back to Ensemble. Okay, perfect. So what I want to do uh, in our demo um, is have a look at a specific gene. Um, we're gonna use the gene name to search. So it's called UQCRQ, and we want to find information about the gene and its transcripts. So what we're going to do is um, use the Ensemble browser. Um, and you, if you're following along in the demo uh, in the course book, you can start on page 18. That's where the screenshots for this section start. But you can also follow along live with me as well. So what I'm going to do is go back to the Ensemble homepage. And I will search for my gene of interest from the search bar. So um, you can choose your species of interest if you want to. Um, I'm going to search all of the species to start with though, and I'll show you how the filtering works in our search function. So we need to search for our gene of interest, UQCRQ. I'll put the name in the chat box for you again as well. And then you can click go. So now actually my results have loaded. Hopefully you have something similar as well. So what you can see is that we always list the human gene at the top uh, and then we move down. So we have some other human transcripts and then eventually we'll be moving on to other species such as the mouse. So if you want to um, filter your search results, then there are filters on the left-hand side here. So if you only want to look at information about genes, you can restrict to only genes, um, or you can search by species of interest. So human only, for example, you can view only human results. So human genes and transcripts. So once you're happy, um, what we're going to do is click on the link for the human gene, which is the top hit here. And you can see this takes us to the gene tab. So this is one of the things that I wanted to remind you about. So um, at the moment, you can see that we've got these tabs that are now opening, opening in the blue bar at the top. So we've got the gene tab for the UQCRQ gene. This is where we're currently sitting. But you can also see that a location tab has opened up by default. So this is the genomic location where the UQCRQ gene is found on chromosome five, you can see. So if you want to, you can toggle between these tabs to go back to the location view for this gene, or you can come back to the gene tab. So you can toggle between the tabs to view the page that you want to, to get the information that you need. Obviously, we're now looking at the gene, so we want to click on the gene tab and explore the information that we can find through the gene tab. So you can see the menu on the left-hand side is now different. We've got all of this information about the gene uh, itself. So it's um, got all these different links that we're going to go through and explore um, in this demo. Um, obviously, we won't go through everything. Um, there's a section on genetic variation and comparative genomics, for example, that we're going to explore uh, in those modules later on in the course. But at the moment, we're in a summary page. So you can see we have summary, we've got the gene name, and its corresponding gene ID. Then we have a description, the gene synonyms, its genomic location and its strand. Uh, and you can see that the gene is made up of six transcripts. Uh, and if you want to see those transcripts, you can click on show transcript table. So 
Um, this is actually quite a good point to answer one of the questions that's just come in from Joanna. So the question is, can a gene have more than one main transcript? So this is actually part of the ongoing main project. So for each gene, ah, so Mihao's put an answer, but I'll also, you can read this in your own time, but I, I will try and summarize what, what Mihao's answer says as well. So for each gene, what we, for each human protein coding gene, what we're hoping to have is a single main select transcript um, that is the most biologically relevant, highly expressed and agreed upon transcript across NCBI and EBI. Um, and then on top of that, then we're also going to have a set of transcripts that we call main plus clinical. So if there is a, another transcript which is also biologically relevant, perhaps clinically relevant, um, is important for reporting clinical variants, uh, then that would be another transcript that is annotated as the main plus clinical. So main select will just be one. And then on top of that, there'll be other varieties of main transcript sets that will also be annotated as well. But this is an ongoing project. So at the moment, we just have main select. Um, and that actually brings me on to what we're, what we're viewing here. So if you want to see a summary um, of all of the table, if, if you want to see a summary of all the transcripts, you can click on this option here, hide and show transcript table. So here we can see the transcript names the transcript IDs. So this is the stable ID with the transcript ENST, the length of the transcript in base pairs, the length of the protein, if it encodes a protein, the biotype of each transcript with the color that we talked about earlier, gold, red, and blue. Then we've got links to other databases. So you can see here, for example, that this transcript at the top here encodes a protein that matches to this entry in Uniprot. So if you want to go to the Uniprot database, you can just click on this link, for example, and it will take you out to this entry in Uniprot. And you can get more information about the protein that this transcript encodes. Uh, and then over on the right hand side, we have information about the transcript flags. So you can see here, we've got the TSL score, the GenCode basic annotation, the APRI and the main select. So um, if you're not sure what each of these different terms means, like APRI P1, you can just hover your mouse uh, and get a small definition about what those um, flags mean. Uh, and these flags will help you to prioritize and pick perhaps the one or two transcripts which are the most relevant for your, for your investigations. So further down, we have a summary, uh, just some links to different databases. You can see uh, links to the GRCH37 assembly. Uh, and this gene in the GRCH37 archive. Uh, and then further down, you can see um, a graphical representation of the gene and its transcripts. So you can see here, these are the transcripts of the UQCRQ gene. We've got the gold transcript, which is made up of these three exons. So we've got one, two, three. We've got the coding. We've got, well, the, the first exon looks like it's mainly uh, or completely non-coding. It's part of the five prime UTR. The second exon looks like it might be almost completely coding. Uh, and then the final exon has got some coding sequence with the three prime UTR here, for example. Uh, and we can see the direction of transcription with the arrow as well. If you want more information, then you can click on them and get a bit more information from the pop-up window. Uh, and you can also see the, the, um, the adjacent genes as well, located close to the UQCRQ gene. So what I want to do now uh, is spend a bit of time having a look at the links in the menu on the left hand side. So firstly, I'm going to click on to sequence. Uh, and then I'm just going to hide the transcript table because I, uh, this, this section always appears at the top of every page. So if I'm just going to hide this table, it will help me to more clearly visualize the data that I want to see here, in, in this case, the sequence. So here we're looking at the marked up sequence. Um, this is the genomic region where the UQCRQ gene is found. So we can see the, the FASTA header here, and then we have the sequence underneath. So this is the genomic sequence, uh, and we can already see some highlighting on the region. So you can see the peach highlighting. These, the peach highlighting indicates that this area, this region is an exonic sequence. So here we can see this is an exon, and here we can see 
Uh, again, all of this sequence here is also exon because of the peach highlighting. But only the UQCRQ exons have got the red lettering. So here we can actually see that this is the start of the UQCRQ um, first exon here. Uh, and these are actually exons of neighboring genes because they don't have red lettering, you can see here. So you can do a number of things with this sequence. Uh, firstly, you can blast it. So you can see the blue button at the top. You can send this whole sequence to the Ensemble Blast tool to do some uh, alignment searching if you want to. Um, or you can just highlight a portion of the sequence using your cursor. Uh, and then when you let go, you can send that selected sequence to the BLAST tool uh, as well. You can also um, format this sequence. So if you click on configure this page, the blue button over on the left-hand side, this will open up a pop-up window that allows you to change uh, and, um, uh, and add annotation directly onto the sequence itself. So, you can see here, for example, that by default, we're looking at 600 base pairs upstream and downstream of our gene of interest. So if you want to, you can change this to 200, for example. Uh, I'm just picking a number, but you can obviously decide how much flanking sequence you want to view. Um, you can also add variation data to the sequence itself. So we're going to explore variation data in the next module tomorrow, um, but you can add variation data onto the sequence here if you want to. So clicking yes, for example. Um, and then you can also add things like line numbering. So there's a number of ways that you can format this sequence uh, depending upon what you want to do, what your own areas of interest are. So once you're happy, you can save and close. And you can see that my sequence has now been reformatted. So we can see that um, we've now truncated the sequence, so we're only viewing 200 base pairs upstream. We also have the line numbering, uh, and you should be able to see as well uh, on my screen the, the different colors um, that are indicating specific bases within the sequence. These are the variants themselves. So the colors will indicate uh, the, the functional consequences of those variants that we're going to think about later on tomorrow. Um, but this is just an example of how you can adds extra annotation onto this sequence to view uh, and to interrogate yourself. So if you want to find out more information about a variant, you can click on it and get more information this way in the pop-up window. The final thing that you can do is you can download this sequence. So there's a blue button at the top just underneath the title called Download Sequence. If you click there, This will allow you to download the sequence uh, in one of two formats. So you can see the format options here, which are FASTA and RTF. Now, FASTA is obviously a really useful plain text format that's um, good for inputting into BLAST, primer design tools, those sorts of um, platforms and pieces of software. So you choose FASTA perhaps, then you can choose the type of sequence you want to download, the cDNA sequence, the genomic sequence, the UTR sequence. Uh, and then you would just click download. The other formatting option is called RTF, rich text format. So this actually um, is more uh, of a static image um, with the annotation on the sequence. So with the fast A, it's just plain text without any annotation on the sequence. The RTF will contain all of the highlighting of the exons and the variation data if you want to show that as well. So if you scroll to the bottom, you can see uh, a preview of what the sequence might look like. So this is what a fast A sequence looks like if you choose that format. Uh, and you can see RTF here. This has the highlighting of the exons and the variation data and anything else that you choose to add using the, the different parameters here. So the RTF format is quite nice for perhaps saving, printing out and annotating by hand in your lab book, for example. Uh, and then again, you would just click download when you're happy with the, with the parameters that you've selected. I won't download anything now, but I'll just save and close using the tick in the top right-hand corner. The next thing um, that I want to have a look at um, is this section called ontologies. So there's a, uh, a section um, looking at gene ontologies. Now, I 
in my experience of, of talking to people using Ensemble, um, not everyone has um, heard of ontologies and know what gene ontologies are. So what I just want to very quickly do is go back to my presentation uh, and just explain gene ontologies to, to you very, very briefly uh, before we go back to the demo. So gene ontologies are very useful um, in being able to describe, well, gene ontologies are very useful in being able to describe gene function. Now, when we're describing gene function as humans, um, we have a very broad vocabulary that can, we can draw upon a number of different words and scientific terms to describe the function of a gene. So um, if I am talking about my gene of interest, I might describe it as being involved in the innate immunity um, pathways. Whereas you might say to someone else describing the same gene that it's involved in non-specific immunity. Uh, and between us, we actually understand that we're talking about the same process, the same biological process, but we've used different terms to describe the same thing. Uh, and we can also be very specific as well when we're um, referring to something more general. So if I was to tell you about my gene of interest that was involved, uh, that was a cytokine or was involved in the complement cascade, you would actually know that these are branches of the innate immune functions, but I've never actually used the term innate immunity when I'm talking about the complement cascade or my cytokine of, of interest, for example. But as a scientist, you know what I'm talking about because of your, uh, your, your knowledge of, of the science uh, and the biological processes. And this is fine when we're talking to one another in the lab and in publications, for example, um, but in databases, this becomes very tricky because things are not standard, the vocabulary is not standardized, uh, and this, this makes it very difficult to store and retrieve information from databases. So what we have done, and when I say we, I mean the scientific community, the Gene Ontology Consortium, um, they've generated um, a set of gene ontology terms with specific IDs that refer to specific processes uh, and biological functions and cellular components, for example. So uh, the innate immune response has got this specific go term. So then all genes that are involved in the innate immune response will be tagged specifically or associated with this specific go term. So that means that now everything is very searchable. So if I search for this go term, I can find all of the um, genes that are involved in this biological process. Equally, if I search for a gene of interest, I can find all of the, the biological, all of the gene ontology terms that are linked to my, my gene of interest. So I can begin to understand its gene function. So with that in mind, if I go back to my demo and look at the gene ontology section, you can see that we have these three sections, biological process, molecular function, and cellular components. So if I click on biological process to start with, You can see now that this is, these are all of the um, biological processes that the UQCRQ gene has been implicated in or has been associated in. So you can see mitochondrial electron transport, subthalamus development, pons development, cerebral uh, Perkin J cell layer development, um, hippocampus development. So these are all biological processes that the UQCRQ gene and its transcripts have been implicated in. Now this comes from a range of different evidence types. So for example, the evidence you can see here, IBA is from inferred from biological ancestor or inferred from electronic annotation. So there's different uh, evidence uh, evidences that are used to make these annotations and they come from a number of sources like the Go Central database or directly from Ensemble, for example. Then we have cellular components. So this is trying to give us an idea of um, where in the cell the protein product of these transcripts are involved. So we've got the go term for mitochondria, for example. So this specific go term refers to the mitochondrion. Uh, and then more specifically within the mitochondria, we've got the inner membrane and the respiratory chain complex three as well. So obviously these are hierarchical terms. They're related to one another, but we can now begin to get a, an overview of the idea of the function and the processes uh, that, this, that this gene is involved in. Um, uh, and again, molecular function. 
this is the final one here. We can see that this is the this is describing the the enzymatic function of our of the of the g of the proteins that the that the transcripts encode. So this is the ubiquinal cytochrome C reductase activity, and this is the specific Go term for that. Good. So the next thing that I want to have a look at um, is gene expression. So if I click on gene expression in the menu on the left. This will take me to a page that has information um, about baseline uh, gene expression uh, in adult human tissues. So we can see here over on the left, we have an ideogram um, of uh, our human tissues. Uh, at the moment, we're um, looking at male tissues, but we can also look at female tissues uh, and also brain specific tissues as well, using the icons on the left here. Uh, and then over on the table on the right, we have information about the expression levels of the UQCRQ gene in each of these different tissues. So on the uh, x-axis of our table here, we can see these are the tissues. Uh, and then on the y-axis, these are experiments that have looked, or projects, consortium, that have looked at the expression level of the UQCRQ gene in, in a range of different tissues. So the, the color of the blue, the depth of the blue indicates the expression level. So if we go to the bottom, we can see the legend. Dark blue is high, light medium, uh, sort of a lighter blue is a medium level of expression, and the light sky blue is a low level of expression. Gray is below cutoff, like we can see here. Uh, and then there's white where there's no data available. Obviously not every experiment has looked at every tissue type, so there's quite a lot of white space. But where we can see that there's these blue bars, these indicate some levels of expression. So here we can see uh, the GTEx project identified that there was um, expression of the UQCRQ gene in the fallopian tube. So this is the, the tissue that we're looking at and the expression level is 90 TPM. So that's transcripts per million. So that's the, uh, the, the units of, of expression that we're using here. Um, you can do a couple of things here. So you can filter the table you can actually filter the table by clicking and dragging on the table itself. So if you click and drag, you can zoom in. And you can also download the table as well. So you can download the table content if you want to. Importantly, we can see that this data, if we go to the bottom, comes from the EBI Expression Atlas pages. So this is actually data that's shown directly from the EBI Expression Atlas, um, which is a separate resource that has information about uh, expression patterns and expression levels in a number of different tissues. So if you're interested in gene expression, um, obviously you can come to Ensemble and get some of the, the high level information about baseline um, adult tissue expression. Um, but if you go to the expression at this pages, you'll be able to find other experimental conditions uh, and other um, perhaps tissues as well. Good. So the final, uh, the final thing that I want to show you on this page um, is the link here called external references. So it's near the bottom in the menu on the left. If you click on external references, this will take you to a page that has information uh, about um, and, and links to this gene in other resources um, that have obviously also got um, information about the UQCRQ gene. So, as an example, we've got the link to the UQCRQ gene in Expression Atlas, HGNC, which is the Hugo Gene Nomenclature Committee, MIM Gene and MIM Morbid, which are databases that have information about phenotype and disease associations, NCBI, Reactome, and Wikigene as well. So this is really a, a great place to come if you want to take what you've learned in Ensemble and then also see if there are other databases that have supplementary information that might help um, help for you to build your idea about this gene and all of the information that you're interested in. Obviously, in Ensemble, we do have information about phenotypes and diseases. We're going to think about that tomorrow, but um, there are dedicated databases that have uh, a lot more exhaustive information uh, about diseases, for example, MIM gene and MIM morbid. Good. 
So the final thing that I want to do um, very quickly before um, the exercises uh, is to explore a transcript, in a single transcript in more detail. So if I click on show transcript table uh, near the top of the page, um, you can see that from the within the table, I can actually click on the stable ID of one of the transcripts. So I'm going to choose this golden transcript, the main select transcript, and click on the stable ID. And you can see this takes me to the transcript tab. So just like we've had the gene tab, we've now got the transcript tab with information relating specifically to our transcript of interest. So we've got the summary at the top here. Um, I'll hide the transcript table. Uh, and then underneath, we can see the exons uh, and the introns as well here in the graphical representation. We've got the length of the transcript at the top here. This is the length of the genomic region. Uh, and then we've got the number of exons, the number of coding exons, the length of the protein as well, for example, uh, and the annotation method. So again, the menu on the left-hand side has changed. So I just want to very quickly explore some of the different um, options in the menu on the left to show you what's available. So firstly, if you click on exons in the menu on the left, we can see that we have information about all of the exons of this transcript. So this exon only has three transcripts. So we can see here in our table, exon one, exon two, and exon three. So then we have the stable ID, the coordinates, the start and end phase, and then the length of each of the transcript, uh, each of the exons. Uh, and then we also have the sequence of the exon itself. So you can see by default, we have the variation data directly loaded onto the sequence. Um, but we can change this if we want to by clicking on configure this page. So we can choose to remove the variation data, for example, if we want to. Uh, we can choose to also show the full intronic sequence as well if we want to. So there's a number of different formatting options that we can select here. So when you're happy, again, you can save and close. And that will take you to, um, this will take you back to the page with your reformatted sequence. So now we can see the sequence uh, and we can actually tell what the color uh, indicates as well using the legend at the top. So exon one, it's got this orange, sort of orangey colored sequence, and we can see this is UTR. Uh, the same for exon two, actually. So the first portion of exon two is UTR, uh, and then we change to this blue sequence. So this is where we find the, H -E, the ATG. This is the start code on here. You can see that I've just highlighted. Uh, and the blue is the translated sequence. So this is the translated sequence. Then we have more intronic sequence in gray here. Uh, and then exon three, contains the, four, the final portion of coding sequence. The TGA is our stop codon. And then we have the five prime UTR, which is this orange sequence here. And we can do the same things as we did before in the sequence view. So we can highlight and blast, or we can download the sequence as well using the blue button at the top. The final type of sequence I want to show you uh, is in the cDNA. So if you click on cDNA sequence here, in the menu on the left, you can see here a cDNA, a view of the cDNA sequence of this transcript. Uh, again, we have the variation data loaded directly on the sequence by default. So I can turn this off again as well using the configure this page option. So show variance, perhaps I'll turn that off just to make the view a bit more simple to see. So here we can see the cDNA sequence. So we have um, each row has three lines of data. So we can see here this um, sequence that's highlighted in the dark yellow. This is the UTR sequence. Then we have the coding sequence itself. So this is then ATG. This is the beginning of the coding sequence. And we can see that the, the, the triplet codons are highlighted in either white or then the yellow and then white, yellow, white, yellow. So these are the triplet codons. And then we can see the amino acid that is encoded by those codons. So the ATG encodes a methionine, then the GGC encodes a glycine, CGC, arginine, for example. Good. And again, we can download this sequence just as we did before and configure the sequence as we did before as well. 
The penultimate thing that I want to show you um, is under the link near the bottom on the left hand side in the menu called general identifiers. So if you click there now, you can see that we have a page here that's similar to the link called external references. So here we can see that we have links to other databases that have information about this transcript uh, and the gene that it encodes. So we've got links to PDB for the, the protein structure. We've got links to Human Protein Atlas, the ENA, Uniprot, RefSeq as well, for example. We've got the, the corresponding NM accession number if you want to go to RefSeq uh, and get information from their database as well, from the NCBI databases. The final thing to show you uh, is in the menu on the left hand side under protein summary. So this whole section in the menu on the left has information about the protein that this transcript encodes. So we can see that here we're just going to get a summary of the protein and the different domains and motifs that are encoded in this protein. But we do have information about the, the protein model uh, and, uh, and other information as well. So underneath, uh, in the main part of the page, you can see that we have a representation of the, of the protein. So this is the ENSP. This purple bar represents the protein. So this is an N terminus at this end on the left-hand side and the C terminus over on the right-hand side. Uh, and then we have underneath a number of different um, prediction methods um, that have predicted the different domains and motifs that exist across this um, protein. So superfamily, PFAM, Panther, Gene3D, they all ex predict that the, the main part of this protein is this cytochrome B, C1, complex subunit eight superfamily. Obviously, when we're looking at a larger protein, it might be made up of lots of different motifs and domains, for example, and disordered regions, uh, and they would be um, annotated across this, uh, the length of the protein as well. Good. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the demo um, for this module. Uh, we just have around 10 or 15 minutes to have a go um, at the exercises for this session. So if I go back to the presentation, you can see that we are now um, moving on to page um, six of the question book. So if I go here, the question book and move to page six, you can see that we have a number of different exercises for you now to have a go at. So we've got um, a human gene, then exercise two is looking at a gene associated with a phenotype. So I haven't explicitly shown you how to do this, um, but hopefully you might be able to work it out using the instructions within the exercise, how to search for a phenotype and then find the associated genes. Uh, an example of a mouse gene, and then also some plant metazoa um, and protist ex examples further down as well. So what I'd like you to do is spend the next um, 10 minutes or so having a go um, at these exercises. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back together at five o'clock just to see how everyone got, has been getting on. Uh, and then we will review ready for tomorrow.